This is William Moberly with the Americans in Wartime Museum on the 21st of February interviewing Wayne Learer. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your experience growing up, where you're from, and, and what exposure. Uh, I'm a farm kid from way northern part of Minnesota, um, and there's there are no military bases around, there are no recruiting stations around, so my exposure to military things was my uncle, who is a World War II veteran Air Force, or Army Air Corps. Right. Um, and that, that kind of always interested me that we had him. My dad was sole surviving oldest son, had to remain on the farm. That was mm -hmm. the rule in that time frame. Um, so in high school, I had appointment from uh, our our uh, United States Senator to the Air Force Academy. And I always had my heart set on the Air Force following in my uncle's footsteps. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I took my physical that I discovered that my right eye is such that I can't fly airplanes and um, the Air Force Academy is not much interested in people who can't fly airplanes. So they offered me West Point and I wasn't much interested in the Army. So I, I went off to school. And um, at that point I was going to a secular university and it was in the journey through my time in a secular university that I went through uh, a discovery of vocation, I guess is what the church would call it, but where I said to myself, I'm really not meant to be doing this, I really am meant to be doing that, and, and uh, I went off to seminary. Where'd you uh, go? Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And um, my faculty advisor was at one point, well, first of all, he's a World War II chaplain. He was at one point the commandant of the Army Chaplain School. He was Eisenhower's chaplain for a while, and he was a recruiter. He was attempting to recruit multiple people. My class, he recruited 14. Uh, and two-thirds of them army. Um, so coming out of seminary, I was um, ready to go off to the basic course, and I did immediately after I graduated from seminary and looking for a, a, a unit. He had recommended to me, uh, of his own experience, that I had to look for the National Guard as opposed to the Army Reserve. Don't have any idea to this day whether that was any wisdom to that because I've seen all these folks across my time. But I, 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 was, I found a battalion of the uh, Florida Army National Guard in the town where my parish church was when I was ordained. And I served them for six years, both the parish and that battalion. Uh, I also did some um, not more than summer camp kind of time. This was the period when the national political conventions of the parties could not take place without them being protected. So I served in a battalion of the Florida Guard across the street from the convention center in Miami Beach where uh, the conventions were held separated by about three weeks. That same battalion of 1,100 infantry soldiers, not my soldiers, but I went with them, um, were confined in the space of one high school building and if you can imagine how much trouble they could get into in the course of uh, 10 days of a convention, um, the phrase I will not ever forget, and I learned a whole lot more when I came on active duty, was from my commander saying, Chaplain, you have to put the fear of God in them. And I kept saying to him, Sir, I think that's your job. I'm supposed to put the love of God in them. Um, that kind of give and take with commanders <coughs> part of my life. Um, I went with that same battalion to the canal zone because the defense of the canal was their federal mission. And the reason I did that, not with my own battalion, um, in the Florida Guard, all the, the chaplain positions were in the infantry brigade headquarters, but none of the chaplains were living in the vicinity of this battalion. So they picked the lowest guy on the totem pole, which was me. And I went uh, with this battalion to its, to its missions, plus my own. The entry on active duty um, is controlled in our church by the church. Um, and I was first invited to come on active duty exactly 10 months after I was ordained. Mm -hmm. And I made a judgment call that it is really not good pastoring of, of civilian people to leave them after you've just come. So I declined that invitation of the National Church. And, the, and I did it with great sadness because the scuttlebutt 
in the 1960s was you would get one and only one shot because there were so many people in the pipeline. But I still thought it was wrong to ask the people to uh, put up with all they put up with in getting me settled as parish pastor. So I settled in with them and then six years later I was invited to come on active duty and I accepted. Um, it was just as Vietnam was ending. In fact, the peace talks were underway. I, my first duty station was Fort Gordon, Georgia, and I was in the school brigade. So I took care of AIT students who climbed telephone poles. Mm. And I did that for two years, and I had a great, good introduction to how you get a soldier from basic training to sending him out into the world. And um, that was the transition point into the all-volunteer army, but these were not yet volunteers. Mm -hmm. So my biggest job in terms of duty time was the number of soldiers who would come to me every single day, I want to get out of the Army. Um, and in my last year at Fort Gordon before I made, went overseas for the first time, uh, I was assigned to, to the, be the, the uh, MP battalion chaplain and we had a prison to be the prison chaplain. And um, for that, I was trained by uh, the disciplinary barracks at, at Leavenworth about what it means to be a chaplain to prisoners. Um, it was a great, good introduction, good to have in your knowledge and skills because there's a little bit of, of the rebel and also soldiers and I think it, it was, that was a great year for me. Mm -hmm. um, I went overseas and, and was assigned to a divisional unit, the Air, Def Air Defense Battalion of, a, of the 8th Infantry Division and I spent 40 months with them three battalion commanders, um, the second battalion commander, and at the same time, the deputy division commander, very into people things, and used me in ways uh, in addition to soldier things. Uh, among things that concerned them both were the number of wives who were uh, being abused by husbands, beaten or whatever, children abused, and I became part of a team with the, the chief cop, the chief lawyer, and the uh, one-star general uh, to try and retrain those soldiers so that they would begin to think that good soldiers don't beat their wives. Um, and if they do, they're going to go directly to jail. Uh, so it was a law enforcement um, chaplain partnership. My first exposure to doing something really, mon really important outside of church all the while, all these times, I'm pastoring a Protestant congregation, a Lutheran congregation, um, in the jail, in addition to the Lutheran congregation, three different chapels inside the jail, not based upon soldier numbers, there weren't that many prisoners, but based upon how uh, sequestered they were from each other. And so if, if they could only be in a tiny little group, you had to go ch do church for them, that kind of thing. Um, after my first overseas assignment, I was assigned to the faculty of the chaplain school, um, and um, well, I should one intervening thing. I was selected for command in general staff college, so my, my utilization tour was as an instructor on our school faculty, and um, that was the first of three assignments to our school. Um, I progressed across my career from being a basic instructor to being a, sort of like a, a head of a division of the school to being the assistant commandant director of training. So uh, I have great love of teaching and I got to do it almost 10 years of my military career was in teaching. Even as the assistant commandant I got to teach every single day mm. and that that was sort of almost as good as preaching. Um, but it was coming out of the school as a lieutenant colonel where I was selected to go to the 1st Armored Division. Division chaplains are a select um, commodity. They are individually chosen, they're individually trained, and then uh, when a division becomes empty, they are nominated by the chief of chaplains to the division commander, and he may he may refuse, but he is warned not to. Most general officers get to have their pick of the litter. Um, 
but because we are board selected and, and school trained, um, the chief is very protective of his prerogative. In my case, I was the second selectee to the first armored division. The person ahead of me, the, then our current um, chairman of the board, General Franks, declined him. Um, and I won't go into why, but he accepted me. And then he left because he got promoted, so I never served under him at the division level. He was at the Corps. He was at 7th Corps already. Um, but the time that I spent in the, in the 1st Armored Division, first of all before the war, uh, one half of the battalion commanders were classmates from Leavenworth. I got to learn some of that meaning that the Army in the other branches really understands about this relationship business being a big deal. In the Chaplain Corps, we're so small, we have a relationship with each other almost all the time. But how we relate to everybody else is almost always they're all strangers, and we got to make um, we got to make nice all the time. Uh, walking into a classmate's battalion is is to be treated differently than a chaplain normally is treated, and it was it was an enhancement to my ministry. Uh, I think two things at the beginning of my time there before the war, my boss. My, my commanding general came out of a school which viewed chaplains as being very much on the personal staff and uh, he would have preferred to have me in his chapel and available to him whenever he wanted. I was trained to be a staff chaplain for the whole division to spend the bulk of my time out teaching and training my subordinate chaplains to make sure they're doing their job, walking with them, in fact, especially when we were in density at places like Graf and Vera and Hohenfels, and see what they do chaplaining like. Uh, that's the real place you can teach. And the boss did not want that. And he, in fact, I have two times when he put his finger into my chest, and that was one of them when he said, I really don't want you doing that. But until he gave me a direct order not to, I kept on doing that and preaching at all of the chapels of the division. First Armored Division had seven caserns in Germany, in Bavaria. I preached in all of them, uh, Catholic and Protestant. And um, somewhere before the deadline, when the boss was going to say to me, you get to stay in town all the rest of the time. He had a cocktail party for all the 06s, the line 06s. And um, in the course of that cocktail party, two of the brigade commanders that I served with said to him, um, I want to compliment you on sending your division chaplain out into our area and preaching in our chapels and being on the ground with our soldiers. His predecessor never left Ansbach. The fact that you knew he needed to be out on the road is really says some big important things about you. I want to compliment you. When I went to, to see the boss on the Monday after that cocktail party, I, I got to do my division job on duty the way I wanted to. With this caveat, that he had a right to complain, he used the word bitch, to bitch and complain about the bad sermons that he would hear from the person that would take my place because the person who would take my place in his mind was not a good preacher. Um, the alert to war um, well I'm, it, it didn't catch anybody by surprise who knew that the country was at war. I think the biggest issue in Yusufur was which units would go. So whether it was going to be this division or, you know, the corps commanders, maybe they knew between the two of them. Um, but at least at my level, we didn't know until President Bush announced the name of the division that we were going. Um, we were beginning to prepare as if we were going, but in a kind of a slow way. And then from the moment that it was announced, the speed with which we did things just was mind-boggling, and, and the number of things to do. Um, uh, in my field, uh, one example, um, you just always assume that there is going to be grape juice and wine for sacramental means. 
just go down the store and buy it. It is not available in Saudi Arabia. Um, one day, very shortly before they took my vehicle with all the stuff that was on it to the ship, I told my assistant division chaplain, who was a Roman Catholic, to go down to the classic store and buy a, a, this box that I'm talking about where we're going to put wine in. It's about four feet long and two and a half feet high because I got to buy it for the whole division. Buy wine um, that will be approved by the Catholic Church. He, if I didn't say that before, he was Catholic. Because if the Catholics approve it, everybody else can use it. Um, he went down and bought, uh, I think the soldiers would have called it Ripple, but it was, it was the lowest level. He felt like he did really well because he got a lot of wine for not much money. And I, and I made him take it all back. Um, and to me, that was a humorous day, and one that he and I continue to remember all these years later. Um, organizing the, the chaplains so that, so that somebody would be in charge during each, uh, each brigade's movement to the, to the theater, all of that. It's, it's sort of like our version of who's in command. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were things that I needed to be doing because I wore two hats. I was also the community chaplain, and the boss was very emphatic that I needed to spend as much time in Europe as possible training the, the newly forming family support groups because I had been on a base that had the Aviation Center was one of my previous assignments, and we had family support groups ready to deal with um, mid-air collisions with the, the craziness that comes from that. And uh, so using my skills from Fort Rucker, the boss asked me, and I was on the last airplane of First Armored Division soldiers to fly out. Uh, I flew with the chief of staff, and, uh, but I, the reason I stayed back so long was so that I could train every single, uh, a, a nodule of every single family support group in the entire division before I left. And then one of the other thing that was just purely a quirk of our division, and, and for which I give thanks to one of, uh, of the wives. On a Sunday morning, after chapel, one of the wives came up to me and said, um, I've heard you say we should pray for each other, and I want you to know that all of my kids are grown, and my husband is all I have left, and I'm a very devout Christian lady, I will finish praying for him in a half hour or so. And then I will have a whole day of prayer time. And I challenge you to use it. So using her model, um, I decided that it would be a good thing if every single one of my family support groups that was related to a chapel, and every one of my chapels had a family support group in it, would take a piece of the roster of the First Armored Division and pray for these soldiers every day or every other day as you. Um, and we divided up the entire printout of the entire division among um, 80 sites in the division to be prayed for. Um, I had a copy of that package of names and on the last day that I was in Germany, uh, on the altar, after Mass and after Protestant service, I sealed that book with the candle wax from the altar and put it in a niche of the chapel as a focal point for everybody's praying, promising them that we would come back and that when we came back, we would give thanks and we would open the book. Um, that was unusual enough, by the way, so that everybody in Usura knew when the First Armored Division's book was going to be opened at the Cotter Rock Chapel, and we had both AFN and Stars and Stripes in the chapel that day, and that does not happen very often in a chapel. About the war. Um, I had just the most incredible collection of chaplains one could ever want to have. Um, and, and I had a... Uh, I had more priests than army divisions usually have, so that every single one of my brigade-sized elements had a priest. That's unusual. 
Um, I had more unusualness in some of my Protestants. Two of my Protestants were prevented by their church's rules from giving communion to anyone except members of their home congregation. So they were not of much value to me in providing sacramental care to soldiers. Um, so in addition to the units that the division chaplain always has, I always have Division Main, which is a battalion-sized unit, I always have the Signal Battalion, I always have the MI Battalion, and then the extraneous units that go, that serve are stuck onto the main. So I have almost a whole brigade to take care of by myself, and with my, with my priest, who is my deputy. Um, but then I added on to that these far-ranging units that, that um, had to be covered and they had to have a priest anyway. So Father and I, with the boss's support, would fly uh, a kind of a circuit every Sunday. Um, it took almost a whole day, and um, we took care of the cavalry battalion, we took care of uh, uh, one of the parts of Duvardi, we took care of the, the three battalions that were close into our local area for which we did not need air support. Uh, and then if there was any reason why some of the, of the priests were short, then we would also fly Father to those places to back up the other priests. Um, so on Sunday mornings, it would normally get to be like eight services. In the course of doing that, I would get to see a chunk of my chaplains each time to see how they're doing. I got to see uh, at least four or five of them every day because I had a, a journeying around the division that I made until the war began. Uh, I had a rank order that had to be put in place in case who dies and who dies and who dies, you have to have backfill because no more chaplains are coming from the states until the war is over. And that had all been uh, laid on and practiced. Um, the chaplains just behaved extraordinarily and carried out, in addition to regular chaplain duties, visiting their soldiers, which, by the way, in war zone, I didn't feel any guilt about this, they were required to visit every soldier in their battalion by every third day, face to face. If they could do it every day, even better. But 800 soldiers, one chaplain, and they might be spread out. But by the third day, they will have touched base with everybody. And their brigade commanders knew about this, and they knew why. Um, the boss gave us an assignment to back up the shrink because there were a lot of non-battle fatigue casualties in the uh, early deploying divisions. 82nd Airborne lost more than 900 soldiers that had to be medevaced from Saudi Arabia before war began. The boss didn't want that to happen. So since the, the division psychiatrist only has five psychiatric medics, uh, but I have, I have 30 chaplains and 30 cha chaplains assistants, um, by visiting everybody every third day, I could look the boss in the eye every third day and say, 100% of your division is good. And my chaplains had to make a report, a simple report, but nonetheless a report. And um, we had access to command channels to send it, but two of those brigade commanders would hand carry that report to me every morning that we had commanders and staff. They would come up from their brigades to the division main and uh, on their way into the meeting, they'd hand me the report. I just found that to be an, uh, an affirmation that it was important work. If a brigade commander bothers to carry this himself, get it from his chaplain, carry it to me, and know that it means something, that every one of his soldiers is okay. That, that I think was part of our contribution to the health of the division beyond the spiritual health. Um, in religious matters, I have no idea how many confessions any of my folks heard, but let me just say a couple things about very religious things. Um, every one of my chaplains baptized people during the war. For a Lutheran, that's relatively easy. I would use a basin from the wash stands that the Saudis built for us, carry it to the place where I was having church, and I could baptize with that. But my, for my Southern Baptist chaplains, that was harder. One of the Devardi battalions was commanded by a Lutheran who went to my Lutheran service when we were in garrison. Um, 
His chaplain was a terrific Southern Baptist, and he had, by Easter of that year, prepared 14 soldiers for baptism by immersion. So that battalion commander took one of his big vehicles, an ammunition hauling vehicle, and lined it with canvas, and then, you know, in, in those water buffaloes that hold 300 gallons, in 300 gallon increments, he brought water to that tank, and he filled it full. I don't know how many gallons that is, but well over a thousand gallons. And there on Easter Sunday morning, 14 soldiers were baptized, and in the afternoon, the battalion had a swimming pool granted to them by the battalion commander. And they knew that it was baptism first and swimming pool second, and it was just a wonderful kind of a cheer that went through. Um, a second very, for me, a very religiously significant moment uh, that also has some good humor to it. Among the places that I went on my um, helicopter rounds on Sunday was to the division t uh, forward, the, the, the talk, which was commanded by uh, the ops sergeant major and the deputy division commander for ops. But they had a goodly tribe of people up there, several hundred. And after the war, when everybody's going around blowing up ordnance and all that kind of stuff, one, one of these very hot April Sundays, our, our helicopter landed probably about 5 o'clock in the afternoon for a 5.30 or 6, 6 o'clock service, I don't remember which, but the, the, the general invited me to come to his van and he offered me a cold drink. He had a refrigerator, I didn't, and that really tasted good. It, it, was, it was purely um, water, but it was so good. And then he told me that out there in the distance, and he pointed maybe 400 yards away from where the talk was, was a little bit group of soldiers, and I could see them. He said, they are sitting on right now the last piece of unexploded ordnance in this area. That is yours to use as an exclamation point in your homily tonight. Anytime you want to do it, all you have to do is salute the sergeant major and they will blow it up. And he says, and every soldier in this headquarters knows that I'm making this gift to you, and every one of them is waiting to see where you're going to put that in the homily. That was a fun moment of preaching and a, a fun worship experience with a bunch of soldiers. And it says something about um, the degree or the amount that the religion played in their lives. Everybody gets more religious as combat gets closer. What was interesting about the 1st Armored Division um, is that um, we did not peak in worship attendance in the Sunday before the war. Uh, in fact, we never peaked until we began to redeploy. Our highest Sunday was about the sixth or seventh Sunday after Easter when the first of the units began to deploy. And on that day, 19 and a half thousand soldiers out of 23,000 assigned were in one of 45 worship services conducted by my chaplains. And I defy any division anywhere, any time that ever had that many soldiers go to church. On that particular Sunday, the boss didn't go to church. And when I reported that number to him, I wanted him to know how big a minority he was. So um, I came back from the war, and I went back to a senior position on the faculty of the school after I had a year in Germany yet because my son was in high school. And um, the division closed its operations in Ansbach and moved uh, to uh, Bad Kreuzheim. And I was well overdue to be replaced, so I did not go forward with them. Um, so Yusra let me stay in um, the, the base, they called them then the base support battalion, but it means the community, the, the Ansbach military community. Uh, which in those days was commanded by a lieutenant colonel. So here I was, a lieutenant colonel on the colonel's list, and I was chaplain to a junior lieutenant colonel, barely pinned on. It was an interesting time. He could not rate me. Mm. Um, I was rated by somebody up the chain. Um, but that, well, I went back to a, a great assignment in the States on the faculty of the school, and, uh, and I think Leavenworth taught me this, but 
for a great deal of that first year and a half, it was converting what we learned to a revision of, our, of chaplaincy doctrine. Mm -hmm. So we were writing down lessons learned and improving the way we deployed people. As, a, as one little, for instance, that you may not think of with chaplains, um, we have too much and too many times done things by the seat of our pants and organized even church by the seat of our pants as it made sense to us and to whoever, the first sergeants or whatever. Th this, this whole thing taught us that the, the, the ministry of the chaplains had to be in the commander's operations plan, even down to when church is being held. It had to be published. That When the boss wants reports, you have to have access to command channels to make those reports back up the chain. And we wrote a system into doctrine so that that could be few, true. And in my, my last um, deployed kind of assignment uh, of any consequence, I was the first Corps chaplain of Fort Lewis. And when I went in there, there were 47 war plans in the boss's secure safe that none of which had chaplain war plans. And so one of the first things I did with my staff was to write a war plan for each of those wars that the boss says was gonna be prepared to fight so that you would think through how you're gonna use your chaplains. And it isn't done by the seat of the pants, but it's done with mm -hmm. certain, certain planning um, things. Um, my last assignment was uh, one I resisted. Um, I was a happy core chaplain at Fort Lewis with a great Corps commander whose uh, wartime mission is the defense of the Pacific Rim. So we went, we had exercises in Japan, in Thailand, in uh, Australia, in Korea, all kinds of um, places I had not yet been and that were exciting. In my 10th month, I had a call from the chief of chaplains saying he wanted me to come to this Washington to be his director of personnel. And I said to him, um, I've never done personnel work for anybody, any place. You and I don't get along. Why would I want to come and be on your staff? And I thought that was a closed deal. I did what any good staff officer did. I mentioned it to the Corps commander that such a call had come in. And, and he said, do you want me to do anything about it? And I said, heavens no. Commander's messing in chaplain's turf is not viewed favorably. But I was forced to leave that assignment, that very good assignment, and come to this Washington to be uh, the, the personnel chief for the chaplain's branch, which for chaplaincy means I was responsible for all recruiting, all of the relationships with the 170 different churches that nominate chaplains to the armed forces, uh, for all promotion boards, for all, um, schools, boards, and keeping all of the records of the branch. Um, and it was a good learning experience for me. I, I never became a master at Pentagon staffing. That was not ever my thrill to do or <coughs> what I was good at. But that's where I left the Army from, and that's why I ended up in this area because my civilian church after retirement is three quarters of a mile from from the Pentagon, and um, which church is that? It's called Our Savior Lutheran Church, and I had a, a full parochial school there as well. So, all of all of the school kids, we were there on 9/11, and um, uh, it was, and and probably as many as a hundred of the members were active duty or retired military. So. Mm -hmm they well received having a military chaplain as their new pastor. Um, but my heart stayed in Washington as a corps chaplain because there, there were so many things like being a division chaplain, but more diverse and more com complex. My boss only had one active duty brigade on the post under his command. All the rest of his corps was either that he owned Alaska, he owned Hawaii, he owned Korea for the purposes of war, and he owned an incredible amount of Army reservists and National Guardsmen. So one of the things, going back to my very beginning, I went to every state training conference for the National Guard chaplains. I went to every United States Army Reserve 
school where chaplains were being trained, and I went to all their densities when they were in summer camp uh, as the Corps chaplain because I was their responsible trainer. Um, and I had a lot of experience training, so uh, uh, I took that seriously. And I've, I've, I've relearned what I knew way back at the beginning, which is to be a parish pastor and a National Guard or Army Reserve chaplain is, takes an incredible amount of skill. You have to keep parishioners happy, satisfied that you're gone every one weekend a month, you're going to be gone. Um, who are willing to understand that your summer camp is not a vacation, therefore shouldn't be counted against your vacation days. Um, these incredibly talented people in the, in the reserves um, need attention and care, and it was my chance to give it. All that happened before 9-11, so everything that I might have thought about them would be in spades because they, they all deployed, I'm sure, um, whereas before, it was a rarity for a reservist to deploy, but I'm sure they've all all deployed. And, and um, so my career has these two opposite ends pinned by the guard and reserve, and um, I'm kind of glad. My church is about four blocks from the, the National Guard headquarters building yeah. on on George Mason, and one of the things I did while I was in the Pentagon was I did their prayer breakfasts, and I continued to do some of their prayer breakfasts when I was a parish pastor. Well, just harder to get in the gate. <laughs> Much harder. That's about all I can think of. Today. Well, I got a couple questions for you. Um, I didn't want to interrupt you during your stories, but uh, when you were uh, deployed and they were going to detonate this IED collection uh, as part of your sermon, what was your scripture and what were you preaching on? Um, this was about the, the uh, maybe the third Sunday after Easter uh, in the. Uh, our, our appointed lessons in that year, uh, the, the, the great catch of fish at the seashore uh, after Jesus' resurrection was the appointed gospel. And this is the one where Peter jump, jumps into the water and they drag this, this great net of fish up to the shore. Um, it was at the point at which Peter says, he is the Lord. Now, I read the gospel reading as part of the liturgy for worship, but when I preached on that piece of it, and Peter says in my sermon, it is the Lord, while there was a context to that in my sermon about recognizing who he is now in your life. But when I said those words, it is the Lord, that's when I wanted them to pull, and they blew it up. <laughs> it's the only time in my life that's ever happened. It's yeah, pretty <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Um, what kind of things uh, did you and your chaplain uh, team deal with with the soldiers? What kind of issues were you ministering to uh, while in the war zone? Um, I think, first of all, the boss kept them busier than, um, than the 82nd did. And it was probably because we knew combat was going to come, and the 82nd deployed at a time when that was much less clear. Um, but. In, this, in these visitations uh, that I asked them to do and where they're assessing them, the kinds of things that they were hearing from the soldiers were, I would call them very normal. There was a certain amount of people are stepping on their toes and treating them um, without as much respect as a soldier might want to have. One of the units I had to cover, it goes with my turf as a division chaplain, as a division band. The boss took, it's the only division commander who did this, but he took their instruments away and made them guards, infantry guards. That's their alternate job. Uh, they guarded the headquarters compound. I walked the perimeter every day. And every single one of those guys complained, complained, complained. They complained about their, their director because he didn't defend them. And, and they had a bullseye on the boss's chest because he had taken their instruments away. One of the things I did, we had a soldier who committed suicide, and suicide is an issue, but we only had four suicides in the division. Three of them were before the war. One suicide came after the war, maybe 10 days, eight, ten, eight or 10 days. I asked the boss to give the band back its instruments so they could play for the 
the uh, memorial service. And he did, and from there on, the band had instruments back, kept them, no longer were guards, and they went around playing for mess halls and doing the kind of morale things that bands do. Um, when I say normal, I mean we didn't have, uh, now let me say it two ways. My agreement with the division psychiatrist was if I diagnose a problem as being a psychiatric problem, even if I don't have a name for it, serious enough for her to see them, I want to be able to call her directly or any of my chaplains call her directly and there's no intervening gobbledygook because we were the deployed asset. That was the promise we made. So in, in the course of that entire deployment, there were only five cases that we referred to her. Everything else we handled ourselves. And that means it was normal. Mm -hmm. The soldiers get upset with each other. Soldiers get upset with their sergeants. So they get upset within the chain of command. And there are things where you, you are largely just the one who hears the ventilating anger because you can be angry at me and there's nothing going to happen because of it. But you get angry at your sergeant and you're going to pay a price for that. Um, there were there were no uh, there were no untoward psychiatric issues within division, and I think that if you were, if you had the division um, staff at Church Advocate sitting here, he'd tell you that he didn't try any any consequential cases either. We just didn't have military discipline problems. The boss made that. Um, maybe more likely. One of the things you had to do in the first armor division is you were in full battle uniform all the time. Even if you got up in the middle of the night to go and take a pee, mm. you had to put on your whole uniform to include your helmet and, and, and uh, all of your buckled on stuff to go to the latrine over there. Um, other units, you just went in your shorts and your t-shirts and your flip-flops, not First Army Division. When you went to the shower point in First Army Division, you didn't go in your shorts and your t-shirts. You wore all this stuff, and then you had to find a place to hang it inside the shower stall. And, you, and there's a line of people waiting to get in there that's 100 people long, 200 people long. <coughs> I have a memory of the division band director uh, losing his sidearm, it came off the nail that it, he attached it to, it came off, fell into that puddle of crap under the shower point, and he had to crawl in that mess to get his weapon back. And there were bandsmen in the line I was in waiting, and I heard all the words that they said, and uh, they were just pleased as punch that his weapon fell in, in the uh, lines. Um, we were in lines whenever we wanted to use one of the telephones to call home. And I was in a long line one day, um, and I, or, ordinary soldiers around me, and I was asking them, uh, because this was after the war, I was asking them, um, a great number of soldiers were looking for souvenirs. Um, it was a danger issue because they were doing things that were dumb. But I, that was, to, for me, that was a convenient way of checking on that issue for the boss as well as it was an interesting subject for this. I asked these kids, and there were people who had found this and found that. And this kid behind me, Spec 4, I can see him still. He held up his hands and he said, Sir, I have two of these. And he pointed out his feet, I have two of these. What more could anybody want to have as souvenirs to bring home to his wife? And he said, I'm not going into one of those places and get blown up. One of the soldiers that we buried is on our list of people that we will memorialize tomorrow. Because I presided over the funeral, I know this. He's one of the people who blew himself up digging for a souvenir. Hmm. It's, a, it's a sadness to lose a soldier and to lose a soldier for something so silly. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people who will watch this, this video don't really understand the relationship of chaplains and um, command, uh, the relationship between the commanding officers and your role, your independence in many ways from, from that commander. What, tell a little bit about that. C Commander wants to know how his soldiers are. And the, co the soldiers want to know that you have enough connection to the commander. This really applies at all ranks. 
Um, so that if a soldier's issue can only be solved by the commander, you have the, the ability to go in the office and be his ombudsman. Uh, so they will know their case has been heard. The soldier also needs to know that not a single word that he says to the chaplain will ever go into the, to the commander's office unless he's going to do some good with the soldier's permission. Everything that he says is absolutely sealed as if he were going to confession. And um, in nearly 30 years of active duty service, I never had a commander doubt that for a second. They knew that the benefit that they got from what we did with their soldiers and what we were, were able to tell them in the clear was more than enough. Um, but we, there are war stories in our branch about commanders who ask and also chaplains who volunteer that which is sealed. General Griffith, who was my division commander, when he left the division, his next job was as the, the Inspector General of the Army. He prosecuted two cases or handled two cases uh, that involved our branch. And in both cases, they were cases where the chaplain uh, did not keep the seal of the confessional. Uh, twice I got General Griffith to come and talk to my division chaplains who who had been selected, who would be the division chaplains in the future. He would be the commander telling what kind of, and, um, but before he did his, his piece in classroom, he looked me in the eye because he knew I was in a fairly responsible role in the school to say, your branch has got to remember to guard its stuff. You cannot be giving away that which belongs to the soldier and expect not to get in trouble. If you guys don't handle this, then the Army's going to handle it, and you won't like how the Army handles it. Um, when the IG makes a finding, um, you better jump. So the relationship is uh, all things being equal. It's, it's one of the brilliant things that the Army has going for it, that um, because I'm on the, the commander's personal staff, I can go in and see him at any time. You know, you got to deal with the realities of the schedule, but I can go in and see him about anything, anytime, and it doesn't have to be an agenda name. Um, I can talk to him about any soldier, or I can talk about issues that involve soldiers as a group, which is where most of them care more about. But the price of caring more about how is the morale of Alpha Company? The price of that is when I want to know something about Sergeant Bradley here that you need to do something about. I expect you to listen to me. And that trade-off has been true for me from captain to colonel mm. uh, and with battalion commanders to corps commanders. Um, when I was at corps, one of the major issues was suicide. Um, we had 40 suicides in the first corps of, of its active duty soldiers uh, in the first six months I was there. And the boss was hugely concerned and I said, sir, one of the realities about training the Army's material on suicide prevention is that nobody who needs to have the training comes. We are the trainers. Uh, we trained over and over and over again. There were, no, there were no captains, there were no majors, there were no lieutenant colonels, no colonels, no generals. There were no sergeants first class, there were no master sergeants. The people who went to the class were the people who were actually killing themselves. And the class was designed to have leaders recognize problems in their soldiers. I said, we'll be able to do something when you sit for the training, sir. I looked in the square and I said, you skip this class every time it's offered, sir. You and your staff need to go to this class, sir. And everyone in line commanders needs to go to this class. And none of the sergeants first class are going to go until their captains and majors go. He was in the next class. Mm. And uh, that kind of give and take. But you've got to have the guts to go in and tell him yeah. that he has to go. Um, even, even if the boss doesn't want to hear something, you have to go in and tell him if it's necessary for him to hear it. And you have, to learn, you have to accept that what you're doing is important enough that in the end, it, it'll be okay. Um, but if you always round off all the edges, you're a worthless staff officer.
worker because you're not telling the boss the truth. Hmm. Yeah, the, the issue of, of veteran suicides, of course, is way up there in the news these days with just these unbelievable numbers. From your observation um, in your 30 plus years, what do you attribute this phenomena to? The first thing that I think is different today is that our soldiers, our veterans, uh, have deployed way too many times and they have a residual amount of unresolved fear and anger inside of themselves that just festers and boils. And um, some of them have survivor's guilt, um, which is not, which is sort of like the downside of, of just being angry at all the death and, and destruction that you saw. I spent some time with Walter Reed with a young soldier who had deployed seven times. He was a, a buck sergeant. He deployed seven times. And he described one of his deployments as, he says, I never slept. There was noise all the time and I was afraid every minute of the day. Now, I know that that's an extreme way of saying it, but when a soldier says that I never slept and I never had a relaxation from this moment of, of fearful place, there's no safety place, um, then your psyche can't recover. In, in more normal times, any time there was a loss, the soldier was at risk. The first three suicides we had before combat in Desert Storm were all from what we would call Dear John letters, except they all came as telephonic because we had that. And now soldiers have the immediate with, with computers. Uh, one of those was a, a sergeant, a staff sergeant, uh, who got a uh, a phone message from his wife one afternoon went in to tell the sergeant major um, that his wife was leaving him. The sergeant major didn't compute that that was a serious thing to say and didn't do anything except say, you'll be okay. And that soldier went from the sergeant major's tent to a place a outside the perimeter that would be as far as you might go to take a crap if there wasn't a latrine inside the compound, and shot himself right there. That within an hour of talking to Sergeant Major, um, Sergeant Major had been trained. He should have recognized, he said it himself, he should have recognized the danger sign. Um, we had another one, uh, two soldiers who were um, two soldiers in the same unit, uh, but who, it was a signal unit from Corps that provided support to the division in two of its nodes. Because of their travel to do things electronic and not having any of their commanders on the ground, these two soldiers uh, took up a, a, um, an illicit relationship, both of them married to someone else. And then one of them was discovered and threatened within an ear, inch of his life by his commander. Um, the female in that relationship took her life out of shame. Those are the kinds of things that at First Corps, it was, we could trace almost all of them after the fact to something like that. And you can't always know that the soldier's gotten a letter or a phone call because it's not your business to be in their business. Mm -hmm. But in the moment that you do become aware of it and they're still alive, you should just almost guard them because the chances of them doing something is really too high to risk. Um, on a happier, funnier side, we had a young soldier when I was a very young captain in Germany in first tour. This, this soldier attempted suicide almost like every weekend. Uh, it was a, a, a very minor cutting of his wrists. And he would be medevaced from our aid station to the 97th General Hospital in Frankfurt. They'd keep him about one day and then they'd send him back. So um, our physician's assistant, who was a warrant officer three, said to me, I'm sick of this. And you should be sick of it too, all the hours you spent in counseling with this lad. We need to send him home. He needs to be home. He's not worth keeping. He's using up all our time. I said, well, I can accomplish that. I can get the colonel to discharge him. He said, well, before you do that, I want to bring him in here and show him how to cut his wrists and see if I can scare him out of it. And, and um, 
he made an attempt to, to do that, and the kid was just totally unimpressed with all that. And I said to him afterward, we're going to get rid of him, period. I mean, the colonel had him discharged in 24 hours. Um, there are those kinds of things where there are gestures and they, are, they mean something else. But um, in the environment that the Army's in now, um, there's no chance to take a chance because the numbers just escalate for everybody. And I chalk, personally, based on my experience, I chalk it up to the amount of PTSD that's walking around the street. Um, one of my friends says it's a million cases um, that, that are no longer in the armed forces but are walking around. And that same friend says all those homeless soldiers from the Vietnam era are going to be these guys and it's a prediction of when, but they're going to not be able to reconnect with society because of this unresolved PTSD. Soldiers know how to redeploy when the, well, I think all of this should have been happening in theater, and but wherever it ought to have been happening, I know that because we had a relatively non-lethal war, we were able to do a lot of things that the book says to do, and you could do them. You could sit down after an event and uh, debrief. Um, and we did that. We debriefed every single battalion. Um, and you could have a spot in, in the redeployment line when you get back to home station where they could check up if they need to see somebody. Soldiers know never to check that box because it delays their going home. And that's what's wrong with what's going on now because if I remember my school books about this subject, um, most of the hard data came from the Israeli army. That anything older than 30 days is already sort of buried inside of you. So you've got to get to this fear and anger and all that stuff. Think about our deployments in 10, 12, 14 month cycles in Iraq and Afghanistan. When did you have uh, safe 30 days to stop and debrief? When we deployed for Desert Storm, we had a plan for pulling battalions off the front line if this war went to many, many days. We were going to pull them off the line and R&R them. And I, I had a plan as part of that war plan was to, um, to re the, the way you would replace ministry teams that might have been also uh, become combat in ineffective. Um, we, did, we had all those plans and we didn't have to exercise them. I'm, if the Army has those plans now, I don't know why it isn't exercising them, except that there aren't enough soldiers to do the war fighting that they need done, and so they can't pull anybody off the line. Mm. I watched an episode of or a whole series of World War I documentaries because I have to do, I have a, had back surgery a year ago and I have to do exercises. And the length of time that soldiers were on the line in those trenches in the European theater did not exceed 100 days, even though that war went four years, five years. Um, they had enough sense to pull them offline, and then they had R&R places for them. In World War II, I think the amount of time on the front was longer than 100 days, but it was shorter than 200 days, and they would be pulled off and refurbished. The, the Army's not different in this period of time than it was in 1914 and 1944. Uh, soldiers can't go for 14 months without getting that stuff purged out of their system. Mm. And um, they are. Wow. That's my take. Well, thank you. That's uh, very insightful. Um, last thing, um, this video, you know, will be available at our museum for researchers and other people to see down the road when they want to uh, learn about a particular uh, experience. What would you tell them about your service and about the value of your service to this country? Um, I'm not very good at observing what my value was to the country. I think to individual soldiers, um, I have a a much better sense because they give you more immediate feedback. And some of it's, uh, some, how does a commander get feedback? It's, it's hard to do. Uh, on the Sunday of Easter, um, we were 
we were, the, the division main was on an Iraqi airfield. It was, in fact, our tents were along our runway. And the, and the runway was acting in the sense that uh, Chinooks could land on it. Um, and the services were held, that's the biggest area that I had during the whole war, most of the time it was in mess tents, was in a hangar. Um, I had set up, I think it was six MRE cases to make an altar. And Father and I did all of our services together until we got to communion. And then we would sort of like go to, if we were driving opposite ends of the vehicle, to finish. On Easter Sunday, on that, on, on those MRE cases, on their own, soldiers had gone off with their styrofoam cup from breakfast and dug up the desert crocuses that were blooming and stuck them in the coffee cups and put them all around the altar. There were almost a hundred of them there. Um, mm. That's feedback, because they don't have to do that. And then I can remember one specific soldier who had a lot of problems in the war, and he verbalized it to me uh, he said, I would not be alive today if it weren't for you. It had nothing to do with pulling him back from machine gun fire. It had to do with letting him ventilate all his crap mm -hmm. and, um, and do it safely so that he never had to worry that it was going to be show up in the street. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that chaplains all over the Army do that for the Army, and uh, I'm not different than anybody else. Um, if I'm, if I'm better at one thing than, than a lot of them, I'm a really good trainer. I learned how to be a good teacher, a trainer. And um, so in teaching my chaplains and, and kind of training them to be better than they were before, uh, I may have done more than some other people of my, of my rank at that time. But in terms of what I do with for ordinary soldiers, you know, that's still the same as when I was a captain. You listen to the soldier and take him seriously. And I learned that on the cell block when I was a stockade chaplain, there were five guys who, were, who had been convicted of, of murder. And most of the guys were druggies. They were in very different parts of the jail. These, these were the first five murderers I ever met in my whole life. At least the Army was convinced that they were murderers. And they were going, they were going to Leavenworth next because uh, the stockades only keep you until your last near-term appeal is over. Um, my job is, n is to go in and, and seriously attempt to be pastor to them, neither to convict them again nor to whitewash what they've done, um, to be open to letting them set the agenda. And I learned to do that with five murderers. They were the hardest people for me to do because my instinct was to not get very close to them because they're potentially pretty lethal. Um, and the other place where I think I, I would measure um, some good things, um, I had one sergeant major, I always salute sergeant majors because I think they do really important stuff. I had one sergeant major who is the stereotypical sergeant major. He has a buzz cut. He's got gray hair, he's got a lot of wrinkles, he's seasoned, he's got a starched uniform, and he has, a, he has this cigar that he's biting down on. The first time I looked at him, I said, Sergeant Major, are we gonna have problems? Because he looked like he would chew me up and spit me out. And I was only a junior captain at that point, and he said, Chaplain, we'll only have problems if when I tell you that one of my soldiers is hurting, you don't care. Then we'll have problems. And he was the best person at bringing people to me that I've ever had in my entire mm -hmm. career. I could have made the mistake of writing him off. Writing him off. And, uh, but he got to me right away when he said, if you, ever want, if you ever ignore one of my soldiers who needs you, then we'll have problems. Then I, I knew we could get somewhere. Mm. By contrast, I had a sergeant major after that who looked sharp as a tack, wore his u uniform better than this guy did, did not have a cigar in his mouth. And he was regarded by the soldiers as the one who spent his time tethered to the flagpole. Um, 
and um, using his energy to pick up as many cigarette butts as he possibly could, but never having to put his, his head on a pillow in a sleeping bag on a tent where the unit was deployed. Um, all soldiers fit into those categories, and mm -hmm. my job is to treat them all like soldiers. Yeah. Now, it was a great career. I still got a lot of green blood in me. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your service and taking the time to interview with us today. Thank, thank you for listening. Uh, it's been a pleasure, sir.